Naval warfare changed forever when mankind realized that aircraft can be flown from ships. This allowed aviation to bring in its long-range recon and strike capabilities to the sea, increasing the range of action to far beyond the 20-odd kilometers that is the horizon at sea level. But then over the years we saw aircraft carrier concepts branch out into multiple configurations, which have their own nuances. The nuances usually come from how much a ship can assist a jet taking off from its deck. We are actually going to approach these configurations in the opposite order of their fielding, that is going by newest to the oldest. This concept was developed by the Soviets after experimenting with vertical takeoff and landing carrier designs, that we will discuss in a minute. They had flown the Yak-38 from their four Kiev-class ships for years, and at that point also handed the jet its combat debut as part of Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The Yak-38 was only good enough for dealing with slow-moving Western aircraft like the P-3, thanks to its horrible performance. The Soviets kept trying to move away from it, and used a two-pronged approach to find a replacement. One of them was using ski jumps to assist aircraft taking off from the carrier without needing complicated steam catapults at that time. Since the aircraft were going to be derived from top-of-the-line land-based fighters, they needed a rested recovery mechanism. This system was basically three to four cables across the deck that a landing jet would try to catch using a tailhook. These cables would be connected to an elaborate hydraulic mechanism plus weights that would decelerate the jet before it overshot the deck. The Soviets tested the ski jump launch concept as far back as 1978, less than a decade after the Yak-38 entered service. Imagine being so pissed at your latest creation that you immediately started looking for options to replace. They used a MiG-27K modified with a tailhook to test launches from a ski jump and arrested landings. The Soviets hated the Yak-38 so much that they had no qualms testing MiG-27 as its replacement a single-engine fighter notorious for engine failures. This concept was shelved until the Admiral Kuznetsov was built and commissioned, which entered service as the first stow bar carrier in the world. In terms of compromise, these carriers lie somewhere between the Cato bar that we will discuss last, and stow VL that we will discuss next. The jets that fly off these carriers are very similar to land-based jet fighters, but have strengthened landing gear and larger flaps to allow for slower approach onto the angled landing deck, and to make catching the wires easy. Takeoff side is what's compromised. Takeoff weights are limited by the takeoff roll available on the carrier and the shape of the ski jump. This ends up limiting payload and fuel load for aircraft that don't have a high thrust to weight ratio. There is a misconception that an aircraft needs to have a thrust to weight ratio of more than one to fly off such a carrier. Well, the Russians use Su 25s as a trainer on Kuznetsov, and its TWR is 0.7. It's just that, lower the TWR, less the performance, and you don't need that much performance for a trainer. On the other hand, the biggest compromise these carriers face is that they cannot operate large ship-based fixed-wing aircraft like airborne early warning aircraft, tankers or carrier onboard delivery aircraft. The Soviets thus started building a ski jump plus Katobar carrier named Ulanovska to allow for these force multiplier aircraft to operate from their carriers. One issue with the Cato bar design is the sheer cost of building, operating and maintaining the carrier. The catapults were steam-powered before the current crop of Emals on the Ford and Fujian, and required high-pressure but insulated ducting to carry it from the boilers to the catapults. The arresting gear is also a complex system requiring a lot of maintenance and associated costs. Basically, a Cato bar carrier assists an aircraft during takeoff and landing, and has higher costs due to the hardware needed to support it. Since the size of aircraft kept growing, so did the hardware needed to support higher and higher sortie rates from the deck. The idea behind Stow VL is that, what if the carrier provided very little assistance to the jet taking off from its flight deck? Basically, the aircraft just does a small takeoff roll and is able to fly off the deck unassisted. While landing, the aircraft needs to be able to slow down to the speed of the carrier by itself and land on it. This was possible for helicopters, but not for fixed-wing jets, not until the Harrier came along. In the race to build the most viable vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, which was needed to reduce the footprint of airbases and effectively hide jets and operate them away from large military bases, there were more failures than successes. Most vertical takeoff and landing concepts had to lug around extra lifting engines only used for takeoff and landing, but were useless for level flight. With the inefficient jet engines of yesteryears, this was a massive weight penalty. 
Harrier was the least compromised of the lot, as it used thrust vectoring nozzles from its single engine to direct thrust both for takeoffs, level flight and landings, thus doing away with dedicated lifting engines. The designers thought, if the Harrier can take off from a few hundred feet of road, why not few hundred feet of a steel deck? Hence the British moved away from Cato Bar carriers, and converted the HMS Hermes to operate Harriers from a ski jump, and deleted the catapults and arresting gear. For Harrier Ops, the carrier just needed to turn into the wind and sail at an appropriate speed, no need for catapults or landing wires. The Harrier took off by itself and landed vertically, reducing the cost of the subsequent Invincible class carriers, as they were designed to be stow VL from day one of service. Since the aircraft has to literally land vertically or at extremely slow speeds which are not possible in fixed-wing aviation without thrust vectoring, only VTOL jets can operate from the carrier. Since VTOL jets like the Harrier operated at the fine balance of capability and being able to fly off the deck, they were very compromised, often less capable than a stow barfighter. For comparison, the F-35B carries the least amount of fuel, while being the heaviest F-35 variant. There is one thing though that is going for them. There is a key performance indicator called sortie rate, meaning how quickly can a carrier launch all its aircraft and get them back. Because stow VL jets don't need jet blast deflectors or retractable chocks to test engines prior to launch, they can have the highest theoretical launch rate, but even the Brits with the largest stow VL carrier don't have enough jets to test it out, rounding out the best carrier in most ways possible at the end. These were also the first mass-produced carriers, and are still in production. Countries that built other types first, and have the funding to build these, are building Cato bar carriers or are wanting to build them. Even though these are the costliest, they offer the most capability by providing the most assistance to aircraft flying off their decks. Thanks to the catapult, the ship can launch all kinds of aircraft from the deck, that don't necessarily need to be as performant as a jet fighter. Hence the US Navy still flies turboprop-driven E-2 and C-2 aircraft from their decks even today. Catapults allow for maximum fuel and weapons payload off the deck, compared to other carrier configurations. The arresting wires allow the aircraft to slow down not so gently, but this means any aircraft with a tailhook and a strong enough landing gear and airframe can land on it, no need for vertical landing capability. The largest carriers today that is Ford and Fujian are Cato Bar, and allow their host countries to host a variety of aircraft. The new generation of E-Malls allow for smaller drones to also fly off the decks, as the steam catapults had a minimum weight limit for takeoffs. The French also have their Charles de Gaulle, a 40,000-ton carrier, and are building a supercarrier displacing over 80,000 tons. The Indians have been wanting to build a Cato bar carrier, but don't have the funding to do it as of today.